Hi everyone, welcome to the first video lecture for Psychology 370, Methods of Psychological Assessment at LCC International University. Uh, this evening we're going to be talking about uh, chapters 2 and 3 from the course textbook. Uh, so we're going to start off uh, just talking a little bit about the history of psychological assessment. So I wanted to start off uh, tonight, actually it's night where I am, I'm not sure what it is where you're at, um, but uh, here it's evening. Uh, so I wanted to start off this evening uh, with a definition of psychological assessment. And there's a couple of different ways we can think about defining psychological assessment. Your textbook on page 75 talks about assessment as the process of observing, learning, describing, collecting, recording, scoring, and interpreting information about individuals. So that's, that's one way to think about it. Um, I come from more of a clinical background, and so a, another way of thinking about assessment is that it's the first step in the treatment process. So the very first thing we do when we're working with a client, with someone who wants counseling or clinical psychological work, is that we need to sit down and figure out what's going on with that person. And so we call what we do in that first meeting or sometimes the first couple of meetings, we call that an assessment. So in clinical psychology, we talk about assessment as the process whereby information, or you can say data, is collected from a client in order to identify the client's needs and to make recommendations regarding the resolutions of those needs. And as I mentioned, that'd be the first stage in the clinical treatment process. And a lot of times, as you know, um, that sort of assessment in clinical psychology would, um, would result in a diagnosis uh, or would be determining whether the client has a diagnosable condition or not. In the more research side of psychology, sometimes we use the word assessment uh, as a synonym or as sort of a with the same meaning as the word measure. Um, and that's not, that's not terribly bad, uh, that's not a terribly bad thing to do, but your book points out that measure um, implies a, a quantitative approach, whereas assessment can be qualitative or quantitative. Uh, there's a couple of different methods of assessment that we use in psychology. Um, one, one of the most simple methods of assessment is an interview where we sit down and talk to another person. And again, we try to determine what's going on with them. Do they have a diagnosable condition? Is, is there a need that we can try to meet as a psychologist? There are two different kinds of interviews we might do. There are structured interviews. Probably the most well-known example of this would be the structured uh, clinical interview for the DSM-5. Um, and this would be a series of questions Help that, that are based on the DSM-5 criteria, diagnostic criteria for mental illness, and they would help to lead us to a diagnosis for that person. A lot of times those psychologists use unstructured interviews, and this would just be an unstructured meeting with the client where we ask a series of open-ended questions and we try to, try to figure out what's going on with the client. So in my clinical work, I used to work with people who um, we're having some sort of problems related to substance abuse, relating to the abuse of drugs and alcohol. And so what I had to figure out with them was whether this was a pathological condition or whether they were just sometimes drinking too much drugs or drinking too much alcohol without maybe, uh, without maybe there being a diagnosis involved. For example, occasionally I'd, get, uh, I'd work with people who had been arrested for driving while under the influence of alcohol. And sometimes those people were alcoholics and needed treatment. Other times, those people who had been at a party, they drank a little bit too much, they got in a car, it might have been the only time in their life that they did that. And so I'd use an unstructured interview to try to collect information about how common of an occurrence that was, whether their body needed alcohol to function, whether that, they got sick without alcohol, and that kind of thing. And you can probably see how that could lead me to a diagnosis, or it could lead me to a finding where I would think the client really doesn't have a diagnosable condition. A second method of assessment that we use in psychology is a behavioral observation. And sometimes we have uh, great opportunities to observe a client's behavior. Sometimes um, we might work in a psychiatric hospital where we see the client interacting with other psychologists, other hospital staff, other patients in the, in the hospital ward. And we can start to get a sense of what's going on with them socially, psychologically by watching how they behave. So for example, when I worked in a residential setting with boys who had delinquency issues, they'd been convicted of some sort of a crime. Um, sometimes uh, one of the diagnoses that some of the boys had was antisocial personality disorder. Actually with, with juveniles, we'd say conduct disorder, a very similar diagnosis. And the juveniles with, con with conduct disorder, they would often have very little regard for the rights and needs of other people. And that's one of the symptoms of conduct disorder. 
And so a lot of times people won't walk into your office and say during an interview, I have very little regard or very little understanding for the needs and rights of other people. But that's something I could observe in the way that uh, some of the boys treated other boys in the unit that I worked on. And so then sometimes I use those behavior observations to help make a diagnosis and to help develop a treatment plan. The third method of psychological assessment, and this is the one that most of the course is going to focus on, is psychological testing. And I think you all have heard about psychological testing, but this class is going to spend a lot of time going into more detail about psychological testing, the kinds of tests that we can give people to determine what's happening for them psychologically. When I'm in Klaipeda in March, we will talk a little bit about interviewing skills and how to do clinical interviews. But again, the bulk of the class is going to be about, uh, about psychological testing. So I wanted to just go over a few important historical figures. There are more in the book, but I wanted to just uh, touch on a few of the very, uh, the most important folks. Um, the first person who seems to have put together um, a psychological test is, is Alfred Binet, who worked in the Paris school system in France in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He seemed to come up with one of the very first intelligence tests and he also came up with the idea that tests classify rather than measure. And that might sound a little bit different from what I said before, but I, I think the point that he was trying to make and that the book sort of picks up on is that in the end, a lot of the concepts, a lot of the things that we're trying to measure are very hard to measure. And so a lot of times what we're trying to do is put people into a category rather than measure something. Because what we're measuring is very hard to quantify. Um, Charles Spearman was another early test designer, and he came up with the idea that intelligence is a single construct or sort of a single thing that we're measuring. And he called that single construct G. Um, and of course, this idea has sort, of been, has sort of been discredited now. Most psychologists don't understand intelligence as a single construct or a single idea, but is composed of a lot of different factors and variables. Finally, I wanted to just mention Leitner Whitmer. Um, Leitner Whitmer is significant because he's known as sort of the first clinical psychologist. He was also influential in starting school psychology. Before Whitmer, he, uh, before Whitmer psychology was seen more as a, as a hard science. And Whitmer sort of took it and made it more of an applied science and took it out of the laboratory and into the clinic and really started to apply it for the sake of bettering people, of helping people to improve their condition. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the different types of intelligence tests. Um, I'm sorry, different types of psychological tests. One that we've already mentioned is intelligence testing. And intelligence tests seem to have been the first psychological tests. There's a couple different traditions within psychology. The Binet-Wexler tradition, based on the work of Alfred Binet and also David Wexler. Um, this is sort of based on that idea that also goes back to Spearman, that intelligence is a single construct, or what Spearman called G. And as I mentioned a minute ago, that idea has sort of fallen out of favor. And nowadays, even the Wexler tests um, actually do look at intelligence as involving multiple factors, multiple dimensions. So this newer way of thinking about intelligence draws on the work of some psychologists named, named Cattell, Horn, and Carroll. And their tradition just says that intelligence involves multiple factors, multiple dimensions. Cattell and Horn and Carroll drew on Sternberg's uh, triarchic model of intelligence. Sternberg said that there's contextual, experiential, and com componential intelligence. Um, also draws on Gardner's idea of multiple intelligences, that we can, have, that we can be intelligent in different ways and in, in different uh, areas. And then um, another idea of intelligence that sort of um, branches out beyond what we, what we typically think about, that's a newer idea, is Goldman's idea of emotional intelligence, saying that there's some people who know how to relate to other people, other people don't. So somebody might be very intelligent intellectually, um, but maybe not have very good emotional intelligence. And in fact, sometimes we see that. Some of the most brilliant people we see um, may not always have the most in, in emotional intelligence. And so again, kind of defining a different area of intelligence. Another type of psychological testing is personality testing. And there's a couple different types of personality tests. There are quantitative personality tests. And these, uh, these involve, these often use Likert scales or some other numerical system for, um, for uh, evaluating a person's personality. 
Uh, probably the most uh, famous or well-known uh, quantitative personality test is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or the MMPI. And it's now in its second edition. There's also the MMPIA for adolescents. Um, but that's, that's an example of a quantitative personality test. There are also some projective tests, and these are interpreted by the psychologist. And I've got to say up front, these are often uh, fairly well known. A lot of people have heard about the Rorschach inkblot test, where, you are, where you're shown uh, 10 different inkblots, and you're asked to, to describe those inkblots, what you see in them, and then the psychologist interprets that. There's also the thematic apperception test, the TAT, which uh, involves showing uh, the test subject a, a series of cards, 30 different cards with common scenarios on them. There's also the house tree person test, which is a, another common projective test that's not mentioned in your book. In the house tree person test, we, asked, we ask um, our subject to draw a house and then to draw a tree and then to draw a person. And then we ask them to draw a person of the opposite gender of the first person they drew. And the, the theme or the common uh, aspect of all these projective tests is, is, is that the psychologist interprets these tests. There's a, there's a lot of subjective interpretation on the part of the psychologist. Because of that, these tests have been criticized. A, a lot of people aren't really sure that these tests are maybe as helpful as we once thought that they were. So there's kind of some, some controversy, controversy, although they are still used um, by some psychologists. The third type of, of psychological testing that I wanted to mention is neuropsychological testing. Um, and this is testing that's done to, to assess the relationship between the brain and behavior. And so I think most of you know from your intro to psychology and perhaps other, other classes you've had that sometimes there can be abnormalities in the physiological structure of the brain and that can affect behavior. Um, for example, people who have experienced some sort of a traumatic brain injury often have drastic personality and behavioral changes, and that's related to a physiological change in the brain. The Halstead right hand neurological test battery is probably the most common of the neuropsychological tests. You may have heard about that in another class. I want to just mention briefly some of the controversy related to psychological testing. One concern is that a lot of tests are developed by, historically, they've been developed by um, white European descended men. And so the idea is that these tests may be biased um, to be the, to best measure the qualities of people who are like the test developers. And so there's been, there have been some findings that people from different countries, people of different races, people of different genders, than the people who develop the test um, may not score as well in the test. So there's some question then about how objective these tests really are. Probably the most controversial test in this regard it, uh, would be some of the intelligence tests. And there have been books written and documentary movies made showing that people of different cultures tend to score less well on, uh, on tests than people of what we call a dominant culture. In the U.S., that would be white, middle, and upper class people tend to do the best on a lot of the psychological tests. Um, one of the concerns here is that people of different cultures may think differently about some things. So things that seem obvious to us coming from our culture may seem different to somebody from another culture. One quick example of that would be logic. People from Europe and people from European descended backgrounds, like most white Americans, tend to think of logic in either or terms. So something is either black or it's white. People of other cultures, especially, for example, African cultures, may use what's called uh, diunital logic, which, which suggests that things can be both and instead of either or. So Europeans tend to use what's called dichotomous logic, meaning something is either one thing or another. People of, people of other cultures may see more of a both and sort of way of understanding things. And of course, if, if the test is based on an either or concept of reality, that can be troubling or that can actually cause bias in the test. Another controversy historically that's been related to psychological testing is that psychological testing in the early 1900s was used in what was called the eugenics movement. The eugenics movement was a movement that was trying to keep less desirable people from reproducing and trying to sort of control them within, within the social milieu. And so one of the things that happened was these tests, some of the early psychological tests were used uh, to test intelligence of people in asylums and state psychiatric hospitals. And if their intelligence scores were below a certain level, 
they were forcibly sterilized, meaning that, that a surgery was done that kept them from ever being able to have children. And that surgery was done against their will, the people had no choice. And it was really using these tests to sort of play God in someone's life, to say, okay, you're of low intelligence, low cognitive functioning, so we're not going to allow you to reproduce. And you can see how that would lead to controversy in the use of psychological testing. Okay, I wanted to just take a, a few more minutes here and talk about psychometrics. Uh, this is moving into chapter three in your textbook. Um, psychometrics is the science of psychological measurement. Um, and your book says that measurement involves assigning numbers or symbols to characteristics of people based on predetermined guidelines, such as translating a test result into a score. And so that's it's just kind of a definition for measurement that you'll want to keep in mind. I want to talk a little bit about the sorts of scales that we use in, in psychological measurement. So scales would be um, ways that we have of assigning a score to a test subject. Um, two broad ways of thinking about scales would be discrete versus continuous. In discrete scales, we have limited categories. So we might have a discrete scale might be gender, male or female. There's only two categories. Continuous would be... Um, unlimited categories, and that could be something like the time to complete a task. There's an infinite number of, of points in time. When we break it down, especially into tens and hundreds of a second, um, it's very unlikely that two people will get the exact same time on a, on a, on a test. And so we can see how uh, time would be an exam example of a continuous measure. Another way of thinking about scales uh, that's similar but a little bit more, um, more precise would be to classify them as nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. And you may have had this in statistics, but I want to just review it because it is, it is really key to psychological measurement and assessment. Um, so if we have a nominal scale, this is very similar to a discrete scale, um, a nominal scale just names categories. For example, your book gives the example of DSM-5 uh, diagnoses. Um, so um, we would either classify somebody as have, having major depressive disorder or not being clinically depressed. So you can see that there's a nominal. They either have depression or you don't. Gender, as we've already mentioned for discrete scales. Nationality, you're either Russian or Ukrainian or Lithuanian or American. Um, and so you can be assigned to one of those categories. The difference with discrete scales is that there are a, fi that there are a fixed number of categories. Um, that may or may not be quite true for nominal. There could be more categories in nominal. Um, political party, political affiliation would be another example of nominal categories. Um, ordinal scales, these are ranked ordered, these are uh, scales where there are ranked ordered scores, but there's no fixed different distance between the categories. So for example, uh, you could have a scale that assigns people a score of excellent, good, average, or poor, and that tells us a little bit more than just a category. It tells us, it gives us a rank order. Excellent is better than good, but we don't know how much better excellent is than good. And so we can't say excellent is two times as good as, as, good as, as a score of good. Um, so you can see how there's a rank order, but there's no fixed dif distance between the categories. Interval takes it a step further. Um, interval would be rank ordered scores with fixed intervals between but no absolute zero value. For example, temperature. Um, so there we know if something is 34 degrees, um, we know that that's half as much as 68 degrees. Um, using temperature sometimes leads, question, leads to questions when I use that as an example, because people say, well, isn't there an absolute zero for temperature? Even though we've got a value that we call absolute zero, Technically, scientifically, there is no, we've never been able to record absolute zero. There's no such thing as the absence of all temperature. And so it's a little bit confusing, but that's why te uh, temperature is an example of an interval scale. Um, the last uh, sort of scale is ratio, and that's similar to interval where there's ranked ordered scores, but then there's fixed, uh, fixed intervals in between, and there's an absolute zero value. So an example of this would be, would be income. You could actually earn zero euros or zero dollars for income. So there's an absolute zero with income in a way that there wouldn't be with temperature. One note about this, and this is a little bit confusing. Um, in psychological measurement and assessment, we often use what we call ordinal interval data. And what this is what that means. Um, a Likert scale, in many ways, is an ordinal scale because 
it, it has people say, uh, it has people assign a value such as strongly agree, agree, unsure, disagree, strongly disagree. Um, the problem with that is we can't do much with that statistically. So a lot of times we assign an interval scale to that Likert scale. So we'll assign a one to strongly disagree and a two to disagree, et cetera. And so this is really ordinal data, but for statistical purposes, we're treating it as interval data. And so if you see the term ordinal interval data, that's what, that's what we mean. Um, there's some debate about this statistically. A lot of times statisticians would say this isn't the best thing to do. Um, but a lot of times in psychological measurement, we sort of do it anyway. I want to just talk a little bit about score interpretation. This is covered in your book, um, but I just wanted to briefly highlight it. Um, there are two different types of, of uh, score interpretation. One would be norm reference testing, and this is when we compare individual scores to, to the scores of other people taking the test. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that. We can use derived scores. This is where we have a formula or a test manual, and we use that to translate the scores for comparison across uh, test subjects. We can also use standard scores, and this is a way that we compare results um, of one person's score to the average results. A lot of times we use um, standard deviation to, um, to evaluate how a person's score compares to the mean score. So for example, um, two thirds of the participants in any test are gonna score within one standard deviation of a mean. So if the mean for a test is 50, um, two thirds of the people are gonna be within one standard deviation of 50. Um, we can standardize scores a couple of different ways. One way that we can do it is by z-scores. And this is where we take standard scores and we, we compute them so that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And so what that means is that two thirds of all the people who take the test are gonna score between negative one and one on the test when we, when we translate those scores into a z-score. A t-score is, is similar, but we translate it differently. And this is where the mean of the, of the test scores would be, um, would be 50 and the standard deviation would be 10. So that would mean everyone would score between 40, I'm sorry, two thirds of the, of the participants would score between 40 and 60 in, in terms of t-scores. We can also scale the scores between one and 999. That's another way of, um, of interpreting scores. There are also normal curve equivalents, or you'll sometimes see this abbreviated NCE. And this is a similar to what we just talked about a moment ago with the, uh, the T-scores, but here there's a mean of 50, but a standard deviation of 21.06. There's also the standard nine or stay nines method of norm reference testing. And this is where we um, interpret the scores on a one to nine scale with a standard deviation of, of two, of right about two. We can also look at scores of relative standing. So we can look at a percentile rank or percentile. And so this is where we assign the score in terms of the percentage of people that have scored equal or below. So for example, if you scored a 95, 95th percentile on a standardized test, we would say that you're equal to or better than 95% of the people who took that test because 95% of the people scored the same or lower than you. That'd be another way of saying that. If we talk about developmental scores, this is a little bit different. Here we interpret scores in terms of either an age equivalent or a grade equivalent. So um, here the score is expressed as two numbers. So we could say 7.5. If we were using that as an age equivalent, that would mean that the score is the score that we'd expect of someone who's seven years and five months old. We might also call that their mental age. If we were using a, a grade equivalent score, that would be somebody who's in the fifth month of the seventh grade. Um, so that's another way of norm reference uh, test uh, score interpretation. We can also use criterion reference interpretation. And this is instead of scoring against other people, we have a score that's a cutoff score or a cut score. And so for example, um, in a lot of American universities, there's a cut score to get in. And so one of the most common uh, standardized tests if you, want to, if you want to go to a graduate program in the US is what's called the graduate record exam or the GRE. And there, there's a cut score. For example, the cut score at my university for a lot of our graduate programs is 153 for the verbal part of the test, 144 for the quantitative, or 4.0 for the analytical. 
So if you score 150 on the verbal, you're below that cut score and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be admitted to the program in most cases. Uh, there's also uh, a means of criterion referenced uh, score interpretation that would look at minimum competency. And that, uh, that's a, a score that defines the minimum standard. Um, and and the, uh, the GRE test uh, scores that I just mentioned would be an example of that. That's a minimum standard uh, that 153 for the verbal would be a minimum standard. There's also another criterion reference interpretation would be force distribution or you might have heard of this as, as grading on a curve. And so if we have um, if we have 20 people in a class, what we might do is we might force their scores into a curve. We might say we're going to have one person who gets a 10, three who get a nine, uh, six who get an eight, and maybe uh, six or maybe eight who get a seven, and then maybe two they, they get a six, something like that. Where we're going to sort of distribute the scores into various categories. Okay, that's all I have for this week. Uh, a couple of reminders for you. I have not gone over all the statistical concepts in Chapter 3 because my understanding is, is that you've all taken a statistics class. And also, this video lecture is getting long. I don't want to bore you for too long. So make sure that in Chapter 3, you review the statistical concepts that they talk about. Make sure you review the measures of central tendency, the normal curve, that sort of thing. Also, make sure that you take the quiz that will be posted on, this, on the class middle site. And I want to make sure that you know the quiz will involve ideas from the lecture and things from the reading. So even if I haven't mentioned the lecture, if it's in the book, it, will, it, it may be on the quiz. Um, the quiz is open book and, and open notes, but you will have a limited time to take it. So you do want to make sure that you've grasped the content, concepts because you're not going to have a lot of time to be looking through the book and listening to the lecture again. Okay, I hope you're all doing well. I hope the semester's gotten off to a good start for you. Um, I will be back next week with another video lecture. In the meantime, please feel free to email me if you have questions about any of this. And I hope you have a good week. Bye now.